Hi all and welcome back to my very first let's play of the original Siberia God version and we are done talking with the gentleman who gave us some troubles, challenges maybe, and yeah we will get right on that but before we do that just want to say that if you are enjoying the game the videos or the channel at large i would love to drop a sub or a like obviously and having said that we uh i still don't think we can do anything with this even though that is kind of fun could we uh We don't really have anything to put there, like this, and no, I don't think that's going to do it. Okay, so what we do know is that we should grab the key, which I think is this one. Telescopic key. Let's have a look at it. Oh, we cannot. Oh, okay. Oh, well. No need to go down there. Already then. We heard that a few times already, and we will hear it quite a few times more, I would imagine. No need to go down there. Alright. So I guess that was locked. So given the options we have, I guess the the gate we're looking for is actually one that we already tried to navigate in the, the first part. The one where we didn't have all this stuff. It's just having a gentle smoke. Hello? Kate? Dan, I'm so pleased to hear your voice. How are you, honey? Did you have a good journey? Have you settled in? I was long, tiring, damp especially, but I'm okay. Especially when you... Everything going as planned? Yeah, I mean, well, not really. It's not exactly what I thought it would be. You know, everything's so different here. Actually, while we're on the subject, I managed to free myself up tomorrow lunchtime. I'll come and meet you at the airport. I hope the flight from Paris won't be delayed. We're expected at the Goldbergs about 8 o'clock. I hope you have the time to take a shower and change, my poor honey bun. Dan, I don't think the Goldbergs tomorrow night is really on. Don't worry, Kate. You'll be as perfect as ever. Anyway, you never have to wear much to look really great. Dan... Dan... I'm going to have to extend my stay here. There's one or two complications. You understand? Kate, honey, what are you talking about? It's only a measly toy factory. The sale isn't going through as expected. I I've got to stay a bit longer. Dan, you don't mind, do you? But Kate, Katie, you can't do this to me. I mean, it's the Goldberg contract. There's millions of dollars on the line here. I know, I'm sorry. You go ahead. Don't worry about me. I'll get back as soon as I can. I promise. Okay, I I I've got to go. I'll call you back soon. Love you, honey. I'm not so sure he's a good dude. Is he just using her for her looks? Okay, so here we are. I think this might be... 
what we're looking for. Okay. Um. Very nice. Oh. This is a lot of options. Is there anything in the water we can look at? So as I said in the first video, I will be looking... Uh, or looking, I will be hovering with that mouse cursor. Like this, every now and again, because in games such as this, it might actually pay off. So we have one, two, three, four, four different paths. So I guess start with the closest one. Oh. So what do we have here? Looks like sort of a mansion. Is locked, but I've still got to get in there. All right, so we need to get in there. Does this look like? Yeah, looks like a path around the house, and we always know that you want to break in from behind the house. I mean, <clears throat> gain access. Anything hidden in the grass? Can we climb this? No. Oh! Wow. This was a lot bigger than I thought. keys that we needed so far in this village. Baladi land, the village where you need keys. The door's locked, but I've still got to get in there. All right. Anything more to interact with here? Oh. In fact, let's give it a sprint. Oh. Looks kind of like a maze. Okay, so this is probably a garden maze, but we have maybe the gardener? Hello. Good morning. You've got a magnificent garden here. Oh, please, don't talk about it. Since my gardener automaton broke down, there are weeds everywhere. You can't imagine how much work it takes me. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. We're not used to doing without our robot help here in Veladilan. But everybody says that we're going to have to get used to it. No, don't. Don't turn around. We're not done with you. Oh, boy. Okay. Um Can we can we actually do anything more here? Good morning. You've got a magnificent garden here. Oh no. Oh please don't talk about Okay, so here in escape you can actually escape through 
uh, dialogues. That's good to know. Because I'll probably be triggering things at times that I don't really need to do. Uh, wow. Here's some tall hedges. Okay. Can we go in here? Oh, it's a little fun. Uh, see if there are any coins in there. Uh, what was that? Really? That's the key? I mean, sure, I guess. And this is probably locked. Yep. No point, it's locked. Okay then. whole lot of nothing even though that statue has seen better days I think so I wonder if this is the type of point-and-click game where there are a lot of empty space it's not kind to call it but like a lot of screens where there isn't anything that you can in actuality do but it's just there for atmosphere. Okay, let's try the key on this bad boy. Wait. Uh, it's very, very tall. Are we okay with this? I think we are in the attic, right? Okay, we can go left and right. Start on this side. Got some weird looking portraits in the background. Status? No. It's a... Okay. So that was just to leave the little corner. Okay, that was actually a magnifying glass. We can do something here. Oh, nice. Um, does that say Anna? Could say. Okay, let's grab all of this stuff. Oh, it did say Anna. I think that's her diary. All right, uh, May 14th, 1930. Yesterday something terrible happened. I do not know who to turn to, who to talk to. So I've decided to write it down. You, dear diary, are now my confidant and sole guardian of my secret thoughts. Hands lies in the next room. He dreamed between life and death, and I am terrified. Oh, the injustice of life. First mama, then Hans. Please, dear little word. Don't take my little brother away as well. And that's probably Hans. Uh, Hans made me promise to keep this a secret, but its burden is it's too heavy. I know I can tell you, though, dear diary. We discovered a cave in the mountains, a marvelous cavern with ancient paintings on the walls. Only prehistoric man could have painted them because they were the pictures of mammoths, which are prehistoric creatures as well. That much I know. I hate mammoths now. It's all because of them and because of that stupid prehistoric children's toy. Why, Hans? Oh, why did you try and take it? And why did I let you climb up there? It's my fault you're in a coma now. Hans, if you die, I do not know how I could ever forgive myself. 
May has... May... <clears throat> Hans has still not regained consciousness. Father cannot sleep and Gertrude cries all day long. Outside the heat is suffocating. But inside the house is icy cold and dismal. I still have hope though. I know my brother. I know his strength. He will pull through. He never gives in. I cannot think of anything else but Hans. In all my waking and sleeping dreams, I see his fall over and over. I see his head hitting the rock and his also pale face softening. I have taken refuge in the attic. It is the only place where I find any peace, wrapped up in all my memories. Five days have passed since the accident and Hans has still not opened his eyes. To see him like this is unbearable. Please God, protect him. Take my life, not his. I feel so desperate, so alone. I want to snuggle up in father's arms, but I dare not. He's just so impassive. Oh, Hans, don't leave me here. It has happened. Hans has come back to life. He opened his eyes and uttered my name. My name. Do you realize this is the happiest day in my life? I want to take to the streets and sing, to proclaim my joy to the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you, God. How wonderful, how beautiful life is. Gertrude and I cannot stop breaking into uncontrollable fits of giggles. Hans even wolfed down his meal today. I knew it was tough, my little brother. Even father smiled at me today when he said, good morning. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I'm totally absorbed in Hans' recovery. I have scarcely five minutes to myself to return to my refuge and scribble down these words. It is very, it is very curious whether Hans is hungry, thirsty, or if he wants something. He cannot stop saying my name. He can't bear it when I leave him even for an instant. Gertrude thinks that I should move my bed into his room to help him sleep better. I hope the father will agree. Today was the first day that Hans has left the house. We went for a short walk in the garden, but Hans is still very weak. The doctor said we should, we should be patient and shouldn't rush him. It is so hard though. I hope so much that life can return to how it once was. Oh boy, this is a long diary. Hans has been out of his coma for a month now. He still doesn't say much and has difficulty moving. He sits motionless for long periods of time, his eyes wide open as though lost in thought. I often have to call his name several times before he reacts. Then he will smile, and when he does, the moment is magic for me, and I couldn't possibly be happy. Possibly be happier. I had to talk to him. The burden was great. I asked Hans about the accident, and he came to find out what he could remember. He could utter only one word mouth and his eyes glowed so strangely when he said it that he frightened me i go back to school today and for the first time in my life i am dreading it i'm afraid of leaving hans alone despite gertrude's kindness and attention i have the impression that hans is much less nervous when i'm there while i was doing my homework yesterday evening hans crept up on me so quietly that he made me jump he took a pencil and a blank sheet of paper and curiously he started drawing it is the first time since his accident he has done anything but daydream Hans scribbles almost obsessively. It is all he will do, all day long. I feel it annoys father. Nobody else understands, but I can see that Hans is trying to draw mammoths. Today's my birthday, and Gertrude has made me an apple pie, my favorite. But father has not returned home for lunch, and Hans doesn't want to leave his room. The best present I could ever have is to see Hans back on the way to recovery. Snow is falling. It is so beautiful. The doctor visited to examine Hans. He seems happy that my little brother has fully recovered his faculties. It truly is a miracle. I don't understand why he doesn't talk more, though. Why isn't he li livelier like he was before? It is Hans's birthday. Today he is 11 years old. I have the strange of impressions that actually he has lost five years rather than gain one more. Jesus. The doctor has just left. I saw him whispering with father. Their serious expressions worried me awful. What could they be hiding from me? I'm grown up now. At the age of 15, you can't understand everything. I'm too scared to ask. Father, what is happening? I have been thinking, and it seems to me that Hans's attitude isn't normal. The shock of the fall in his coma must have had much more serious effects than we first imagined. Hans, my dear brother, what is happening to you? I have discovered the truth. Hans is stunted physically and mentally. I eavesdrops a conversation between the doctor, father, and Gertrude. Gertie buried her tear-filled eyes in her apron, and Father muttered the word retard under his breath. How could he say such a thing? It is Easter and we're on school holidays. This means I can spend all day with Hans and protect him from Father's permanent dark moods. 
you can't accept the fact that Hans, his only son, will stay in this state forever. It is truly difficult to accept, but it is not Hans's fault. Mine maybe, but not Hans's. I don't know how to make father understand. He seems full of hatred for him. It is dreadful. I feel so powerless. One year. One year has gone by and it feels like an eternity. The situation shows no signs of improvement, neither in terms of Hans's mental health or father's attitude towards him. Extraordinary. Father has decided to take Hans to Paris for a new test. He says that only in the French capital will we find truly competent doctors. We must make Hans ready for a great expedition. No news from father and Hans, but I remain hopeful. I'm sure they will take good care of my little brother. They have returned. Hans rushed into my arms and started crying. It took me a long time to calm him down and get him to sleep. Father still has Tan's turn as he was before he left. The French doctors have confirmed the diagnosis. Hans will remain physically and mentally impaired. I am stunned. The summer is coming to a close. It has been less stifling than the last. The sun has put color in Hans's cheeks. When I look at him, I have difficulty imagining that it will not change. Father still says nothing and increasingly shuts himself away in his office at the factory. Gertrude tells Christmas. Gertrude tells me that love and faith triumph over any science. I lack night. God be praised. Father took Hans to the factory this morning. Hans was so afraid that I accompanied them. Fortunately, Father said nothing. I failed to understand why he insisted on bringing him there. Father left for the factory with Hans once again this morning. I think he wants to persuade Hans that he could be useful for something. It is his way of resisting fate. For a month now, every morning Hans has gone to work with Father at the factory. I'm not exactly sure what he does there, but he seems to enjoy it. I feel my brother's behavior has changed considerably. He is much less capricious. Uh, April. I could cry. Hans has made a present, a small robot, robot mammoth with a trunk that rises and falls. When Father saw it, he nodded his head in satisfaction. Both Gertrude and Father now have their own robot mammoths. Theirs are even more intricate and finely tuned. Little brother is not such a retard after all. Hans mammoth. Mammoths now walk, raise their trunks and walk, wag their tails. It's incredible. December. I met the head of the factory workshop, Mr. Grips, this morning. He says that for a young lad of 12, Hans is very gifted. It is a shame he only makes elephants. They're mammoths. Uh, Father and Hans were locked in a long discussion yesterday, or should I say Hans was locked in one of Father's long monologues, as it is inconceivably that Hans should go to school like other children. Father wants to take him on as a worker at the factory. However, Hans will have stopped, will have stopped making his own little devices. Has signed his half gaping mouth and staring eyes finally sent Father off in a rage. Oh boy. <clears throat> I tried to broach the subject with Hans. I suggested he should obey Father. Learning a craft at the factory is his one chance to do something constructive with his life. He's so gifted and takes so much pleasure in making automatons. He did look like he wasn't listening to me, but I know he'll think about what I said. It's not that Hans can't speak, it's rather that he doesn't want to speak. He used the least possible words for communication, except with me, but he's still very economical with words. Incredible. Hans was not just satisfied with learning how this assembly line works. Instead, he has completely redesigned it. Father and Monsieur Grips are taking a serious look at his plans. Fathers want to talk to me about my future since I passed my exams. He wants to send me to university because he says my intelligence is astounding. My heart was beating so loud. It is true I do love studying, but I couldn't bear to be away from Hans. What a ghastly summer. I have been permanently torn between my desire to go to university and my refusal to leave my brother. I talked about it with Hans, but he said nothing. That same evening I found my own little mammoth broken. Oh boy. Hans had another bit of hysterics at dinner again. Father announced that Hans's new assembly line would soon be finished. However, they had removed the automaton parrots that shout order as they were deemed superfluous. Hans was livid. He hurled his soup dish to the ground and stormed off to his bedroom. What will happen between the both of them when I'm not here? Despite my scruples, I'm finally leaving. Hans has not talked to me for a week. Father would not understand if I told him why I wanted to stay. My heart is so heavy. It is so strange to be home. I had never left home for such a long time before. Once we were alone, Han alone Hans did not stop talking. Words just leaped from his mouth. How we laughed at his excitement. He presented me with a delightful little ballerina. To replace the mammoth, he told me. 
I was so touched that I started crying. Distance has done nothing to harm this strong bond between us. It is strange to pick up this diary once more. At first, my impulse was to tear it up, but I resisted and instead succumbed to my second desire, which was to write for a while. I'm alone in my attic once more. I have been home for two months now, and after a summer spent living with the intense joy of being reunited with my brother, Hans has returned to the factory. Father has aged so, and Gertrude's arthritis causes her terrible pain. All in all, these last four years have been kind to Father and Hans. The relationship is less tense, they still do not exchange much conversation, but they now have a thing in common, the factory. I'm even beginning to feel a bit jealous, silly really. Hans hasn't changed, to help Gertrude he has designed a totally automated kitchen, and Gertrude can't stop moaning at the wooden puppets. Oh how I adore them. I went to go and see Father and Hans at work. I hadn't been to the factory for ages, it is strange how much it has changed. It was very curious. I was very curious to see them set about their tasks. I like Father's new office very much. Hans has a small workshop on the first floor, crammed with odds and ends, and finished robots and design, exactly as I imagined it, in fact. The factory is working very well. Orders for toys keep coming in, spurred on by the run-up to Christmas. When I was at university and I said my name was Vorlberg, people would ask me if I had any relation to the Vala Dillon factory. Now I know the effect that Hans's genius has had on the factories now. To make myself useful, I started helping father set his papers in order. The most extraordinary thing of all is that for the first time ever, I have the impression that the three of us form a real family. Hans never ceases to surprise me, neither does this diary. Man, it's long. Between home and the factory, his behavior is so very different. In his workshop, he is seriously, he is serious, concentrated, a proper young man who keeps his eye on everything going on, constantly on the move and in control. One has the impression that each single toy is his very own infant. At home he turns back into a child once more and is either moody or a happy-go-lucky buffoon. The most wonderful Christmas of my whole life. Hans and I could not stop giggling, my children beneath father's disapproving glare. I know that he was only pretending really. Our hearts are so full of hope. Hans came to see me in my bedroom yesterday evening. I felt terribly awkward terribly ill at ease. I might have guessed. Hans wants to leave. Leave Valadelen. The house in the factory wants to go traveling. He doesn't know where to or for how long. That's just like him. I was so shocked that I told him his plans were foolish. He left my room without a word. His head bowed. Bowed. Oh no. And oh no. <laughs> I thought that he wanted to leave because of father. Not at all. It's because of the mammoths. He wants to go tracking mammoths. I thought I'd gotten over his obsession. I knew my brother only too well. I wouldn't dream of telling him his quest is useless. It isn't worth it. He will not listen to reason. January 10th, 1930. I was a selfish the other evening. I returned to Hans and I asked him gently if he was sure of his decision. I already know that the reply is what the reply is going to be. Nothing will make him change his mind. Despite my profound sadness and despair, I must help Hans fulfill the destiny he has chosen and announced the news to father. I fear the worst. The worst was worse than my fears. Father's anger was terrifying. He shut Hans away in his workshop at the factory and has forbidden all visits except from Gertrude who feeds him. Father has decided that Hans should remain locked up for as long as it takes him to abandon his infantile decision. Gertrude tells me that Hans is very despondent, yet highly resolute. The worry is driving me mad. As soon as Gertrude returns from the factory, I hasten to get news of my little brother. He doesn't say anything, he just fills with bits and pieces, she replies every day with a sigh. I have tried desperately to reason with father, but I know I am just wasting my breath. Hans is 18 years old today, and he's, he's all on his own for his birthday. In secret, Gertrude delivered to me a small robot from Hans. It's a robot of us as children. It works with a small cylinder punched with tiny holes. I quiver with emotion as I turn the key. The message it gave me was simple. He was telling me he loved me very, very much. Gertrude gave me a different tiny cylinder for today's toy. Hans is truly incredible. He has found a means of communicating between us and us alone in total secret. My days are spent eagerly awaiting Hans's messages. He has now resolved to run away. He's preparing his escape like if it was a game. <sighs> Gertrude has returned and she is beside herself. Hans has disappeared. Father has not even designed to return to the workshop where he looked up his son 
nor find out how he managed to escape, just gave me a black look, as if he knew we were up to something behind his back. It is beginning to dawn on me that Hans has gone. I miss him so much. Lord, please protect my little brother and watch over him for me. With Hans gone, father now locks himself away night and day at the factory. The house is so gloomy now. This morning I caught father in the drawing room installing a coffin on a trestle. The sight it made my blood freeze. What on earth is he up to? My questions meet only with stony silence and a permanent black countenance. Behind closed curtains, the dreaming drawing room with the coffin surrounded by huge cans has become a veritable funeral chamber. This is ghastly. I've just understood what father is up to. This morning, the priest came to pray before the coffin and finally caught on. Father is in mourning for the death of Hans. Father made the priest believe that his son was dead. How could he do such a thing? Because he's an idiot. In the madness occasioned by his grief, my father grows ever more cold and calculating. He contacted his old friend, Dr. Schmoll, who duly drew up a bona fide death certificate without even seeing the body. I dare not imagine what yarn he spun. Hans's funeral will be officially held next Sunday. Father strictly forbade me to attend. This sordid masquerade makes me feel ill, but I cannot denounce the subterfuge, or else I will display my father's mental instability to the world. The shame would kill him, that much is certain. I have to get away, far, far away. No, I will not leave. I have thought long and hard. My life is here, next to my father. He needs me too much now. The factory needs me, because father is incapable of running it now. Besides, I can only find peace of mind among Hans's robots. And how shall I know when he has sent me when he has sent me new ones if I am not at home to receive them? No, I shall not leave. My destiny is to remain here and keep watch. Who? That was a lot of diary, but we also got a lot of information, which is really, really nice. And I think that, that all that reading actually kind of took up this part, and we will continue to do some exploration in the very next one. Thank you for sticking with me when I read a lot of diary entrances in this video. I hope you had as much fun as I still had. I would love it if you dropped a sub or a like and if I saw you again in the next part. But for now, it is time to say bye-bye.